complex analysis, complex numbers, right? Complex numbers are x plus i, y, x and y are real. Why? Why do we care? So that's complex numbers, analysis, calculus, right? Analysis is a fancy way for why to study calculus over the complex numbers. Well, why study complex numbers at all? Why do you care about complex numbers? How do they, what, what problems do they solve for you? Should I pick on someone? We, we got to get used to uh, people, people talking. H Hannah, you were trying to say something? Yeah. What kind of polynomials? They're algebraically complete. They are algebraically complete. Um, people started studying complex numbers long before they understood any of any of those things. They were studying polynomials. And so what do you need? What do you need complex numbers in order to be able to solve? Yes. Okay, great. That's exactly what I wanted someone to say because it's what I thought too. Sorry, Ishan, you wanted to say more? Um, I know that later they want to solve cubic polynomials. Aha. Uh -huh. They want to use complex numbers to get to the solution. They were like, this doesn't make any sense. I don't like this. Excellent. Excellent. So what I thought until I, until rather late, I didn't learn this uh, for quite some time, um, need need complex numbers to solve quadratics. It is a two-dimensional division algebra. Again, these are all things that became important much, much later. So people were already studying complex analysis for a long time before they understood what a division, what an algebra was, and then what a division algebra was. So, of course, what is, what is i, right? i is the square root of negative 1. So you're solving a quadratic. This is not the case. In fact, um, this, so you know, you know, you're looking at y equals x squared plus one, and you're trying to figure out where does it cross the x-axis. But of course, it never crosses the x-axis. There are no solutions. There are no solutions, and there's no problem. You don't need i to solve quadratic equations, because if there are no solutions, that's it. You do need i, exactly as Ishan said, to solve cubic equations. So in fact, uh, people historically cared about i square root of negative one before they cared about they believed in as a number negative one itself they had complex numbers before they had negative numbers think about that how could you possibly have complex numbers before you believe in negative numbers so i'm going to prove this to you Okay, so indeed, as, as Ishan said, this happened because people were trying to solve cubic equations. Now, the thing about a cubic, if I have y equals x cubed plus, I don't know, 12x minus 15, whatever this is, I have no idea what the shape of this curve is. It's going to be some cubic, right? What do I know? It, it starts at negative infinity, and it ends at positive infinity. So whatever it does, maybe it crosses once, maybe it crosses twice. Well, it can only wiggle one time. All right, let's, let's at least make it a cubic. I don't know if it's going to cross twice, three times, once. It has to cross once. It starts negative, ends positive. Okay? So there is a root. And the question is, how do you find the root? Does anybody know the history of, of cubic equations? What the solution of the cubic is called? It's okay if you don't. There's, again, there's absolutely no shame in saying, oh, don't know. Tell me. I mean, I'm familiar with um, someone by the name of Cardano. Yes, very sure good. Very good. Do you know the story of Cardano's cubic? I, I don't think I'm going to waste okay. I, I vaguely remember it has to do with someone solved it. Then someone else um, learned how to solve it from them, but promised not to write down how to solve it. Then they wrote down a solution, but claimed, you know, I got to this solution differently, so it doesn't count. And then some other controversies ensued, I guess. Um, yes. There was a student by the name of Ferrari who did yes. some work. Yes, exactly. Exactly. I don't know. I, I don't think I'm going to waste the time telling you this. Do you, do you want to know this story? This is like one of my favorite stories, but maybe we should go on to math. 
Yes, you want. Back in the time of factoring and competition. This was back in the time. Yes. So okay, fine. Let, let me tell. Let me tell you an abridged version of this story because I think it's uh, it's just one of my favorites. Um, so this is in the late 1400s, early 1500s, like 1495 or something. There's a book by uh, Luca Pacioli. Some uh, everything is happening in Italy. So this is, I think, Pacioli. So don't quote me on any of the dates or the locations. But he, he says, uh, he, he writes a, a, a textbook, which is a compendium of all the known mathematics before that time. And, um, and in it, he says, you know, here's how you solve quadratics. By the way, every single civil civilization, the ancient Babylonians, the Egyptians, the Greeks, the, the Chinese, the Indians, everybody solved quadratic equations. Every single civilization saw the importance of solving quadratic equations and then went ahead and did it. And as far as I know, there's one time period in the history of humanity where a cubic equation was solved. And it was something in the water in 1500 Italy that all these people are drinking and it's, it's in the air, it's in the water and everybody gets, gets into it somehow. So it's an amazing story. Pacioli says, here's how we all know how to solve quadratic equations. And it seems that a general cubic equation is as unsolvable as squaring the circle. Okay, so he says cubics are as unsolvable as squaring the circle. So this is, this is what people are, are really feeling at the time. This is, this is a master uh, uh, mathematician, expositor. And so the first person in the story is a guy named Del Ferro. Uh, let me make a cartoon. This is Italy. I don't know. I think he's in Bologna or something. Let's pretend he's in Bologna. Okay. Del Ferro in the 1510s, let's say, figures out how to solve a cubic, um, a depressed cubic. So he solves a depressed cubic. Depressed cubic. So a general cubic is ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d. A depressed cubic is, there's no quadratic term. So it's this special case. Um, as you'll see in a second, he sh if he had negative numbers, he would have been able to immediately solve the general case, but because he didn't, and, and you'll see the state of algebra uh, at this time. It's really quite poor. Anyway, he solves a de depressed cubic, and as who was who was uh, telling me all this stuff about Cardano and Ferrari? I didn't see who was speaking. Oh, it was uh, me. Hi, Ozan. Ozan. Okay, great. Sorry, I don't know how to. Um, for some reason, I can't find the. Uh, but turn the visual on thing so I can't make myself appear on. It's on the bottom left, at least on my screen. I only see the mute button. Weird. All right. Well, we'll figure it out. Um, right, what was that? Computer have a camera? Sorry? Um, yes, my, my computer has a camera up top. Um, previously, I've been able to, for some reason this time, it's not available, it's not showing up. Weird. All right. Um, no worries. So, uh, where were we? Right, as, as Ozan mentioned, um, when, at this time, you would think, you, you made a new scientific discovery, right? What do you do today when you make a new scientific discovery? You write a paper, you post it on archive, you send it to a journal, right? You're trying to tell the world about this discovery that you made. It's not called the Del Ferro Cuban. Um, at the time, this is, you know, Renaissance Italy, the way a mathematician had a job was there was some rich person and they were in that person's court, right? There's a prince who's uh, paying me to be the court jester and they have, uh, they have someone doing astrology and someone doing medicine and they have uh, a mathematician that they keep around to, to help them with calculating various things. And in the meantime, they let that mathematician, um, you know, mathematicians can't help but, doing, but, but do research and, and try to solve new problems. And uh, the way that you got such a position is you challenged the person who currently has that position to a, 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 pop, a duel, a duel in front of uh, everybody around. And so um, you would come into town and you would say, 
hey, Kontorovich, I want your job. I'm going to challenge you, and here are 20 of my problems, and I would give you 20 of my best problems. And, and a week later, we would see who could solve more of each other's problems. And the popular opinion, you know, sort of vote by uh, boos and ahs in, in, the, in the town center, would determine who has the job. So why isn't Del Ferro telling anyone his solution to the depressed cubic? He wants to keep his job. He, he wants tenure. That's the Renaissance version of tenure. If you know that, if you have this depressed cubic in your back pocket and someone comes at you with like some really hard problems, you're not sure what you're gonna do, you're gonna throw in, sprinkle in a couple of depressed cubics into your solution set, knowing that no one can solve it. Not only can no one solve it, everyone thinks it's unsolvable. Okay, so this is job security in 1500 Italy. So he doesn't tell anyone. On his deathbed, let's say that's uh, 1520, maybe, 15, I forget what it is, 1518. Let's say 1520s he dies. And on his deathbed, he tells his last student, Antonio Fior. He tells Fior, he's not going to take this to his grave. He tells Fior, here's how you solve a depressed cubic. Um, what does Fior do with this, armed with this sort of nuclear warhead? What's a young, you give an 18 year old a, a big, uh, you know, weapon. Well, I guess he tells someone. He doesn't tell someone. He goes and starts attacking all of the math, all the most, most famous uh, popular mathematicians and, and taking their jobs. He shows up, you know, Fior shows up at my office and says, I challenge you to a duel. I say, all right, I send you some geometry problems, some trigonometry, some uh, analysis, you know, all the things. I guess they're not really doing analysis yet. All, all of the things that I think are difficult mathematics of the day. Fior can't solve any of them, but he sends me 20 depressed cubics, and I can't solve any of them. So I'm, I'm uh, humiliated, and the, my patron says, yeah, I want Fior, I don't want you. Let's say he can solve one of my problems, and I can't solve any of his, right? So he, he starts uh, uh, assaulting people with the depressed cubic, goes on the attack, un and is, is quite successful until he attacks someone named Niccolo... Uh, Tartaglia. That's not really his name. Tartaglia means a stammerer. He was like stabbed in the sword. You know, this is a time of great violence and, and whatnot. So he, there was some, I don't know, French soldier or something that stabbed him in, in the face as a kid and he had this big scar and he stuttered when, when he spoke. And he, anyway, so, um, so he attacks Tartaglia. Tartaglia uh, is uh, e extremely well-renowned mathematician. He, um, he gave the one of the first uh, serious Latin transcriptions of Euclid's elements, which had only been uh, transcribed, it, it carried over in, in the Arabic from the Greek. It had been taken from uh, the Greeks to, um, to Baghdad, which was the capital of mathematics for some 800 years or so. And uh, Tartaglia, anyway, he's a, he's a famous guy. He's doing a lot of great things. Um, Fior challenges him and as usual, Tartaglia gives him all his best problems from geometry, from uh, algebra, whatever. Fior sends him 20 depressed cubits. And Tartaglia is extremely right, and he has the following epiphany. If Fior is giving me 20 depressed cubits, then maybe a depressed cubic is solvable. Unlike what everyone else thinks, that it's not solvable. So he has... It's, this, it's a huge weight lifted off of your shoulders when you think that something is unsolvable. When someone says, no, no, it's solvable, and you go, oh, well, then why can't I figure it out? Okay, so that's psychology. You must play these psychological games with yourself. When you're solving problems, anytime you see a problem, it is solvable if it's been given to you. I mean, I'm talking about homework. I'm not talking about research. Uh, a homework problem is solvable. So that is a weapon that you should use against the problem. The fact that it has a solution is a very powerful piece of information because there are lots of problems that we, I mean, the reason I have a job is because there are lots of problems we don't know how to solve. So um, Tartaglia figures out how to solve, figures on his own, figures out how to solve, well, let's say re, rediscovers how to solve cubics. Okay, so he shows up the next day. Here, Fior, here's your 20 solutions. Here's, your, here's the solutions to your 20 depressed cubics. I got them all. Fior is humiliated, never seen, never heard from again. He's gone. 
But of course, all these things are, are taking place publicly. That's the whole point of, of these duels, mathematical duels. They're, they happen publicly. And um, so people know that Tartaglia was given 20 cubics and he managed to solve them all. Maybe he knows how to solve it. Maybe a solution exists. So, so the clock is really ticking. And Cardano, so Cardano uh, was a doctor and kind of a polymath. He, um, he wasn't under anyone's uh, patronage. And he comes to Tartaglia. This is now uh, 15, let's call it 1530s. Again, none of these dates are, are really right. So let's, let's give Tartaglia a location. I think he's in uh, Venice or something. Is that right? I don't know. Whatever. That's not, that's not important. Uh, Cardano shows up at Tartaglia's uh, institution and says, you know how to solve the depressed cubic. Please tell me how to solve the depressed cubic. And I'll write a, I'm, ri I'm writing a compendium, an update to Pacioli's uh, compendium. And I will give you full credit. And I will say I learned this from Tartaglia. And it'll be Tartaglia's cubic and so on. And Tartaglia says, uh, no, you think I'm a fool. Uh, it's not the person whose name is in the footnote that it's named after. It's the person whose name is on the page. I'm writing my own book. When I'm good and ready, I'll, I'll give it to you. And Cardano keeps begging, begging, begging. Eventually, he invites... Um, Cardano is in... God. All right, give me another city in Italy just to have a location. It's not Rome. Let's pretend it's Rome. And that's not where Rome is anyway. I just want something, some name to write there. So Cardano invites Tartaglia. Uh, wines him, dines him. Eventually... Tartaglia says, all right, as a Christian, this is, you know, an important uh, thing. You will, you will swear a solemn oath to God that you will never reveal this, the solution of the depressed cubic to anyone. And then I will tell you. And Cardano reluctantly says, okay, it's not going in my book. What can I do? I still, I want to know. So he solemnly swears to Tartaglia that he will not reveal the depressed cubic to anyone. So Tartaglia, Cardano, gets Tartaglia to um, tell him to reveal the solution and goes home and honors his, his promise. Um, not long thereafter, Ferrari is a young guy, shows up on Cardano's doorstep and says, I want a job. And Cardano says, okay, wash my floors and uh, clean my windows. And Ferrari, it turns out, has a really strong aptitude for mathematics and soon becomes Cardano's student and soon becomes Cardano's collaborator. And to Ferrari, Cardano reveals, uh, I mean, it's in his note notebook, so Ferrari sees how to solve the depressed cubic. And Ferrari and Cardano together figure out how to solve all cubics. So they now have, so together they solve all cubics. And then eventually they solve all quartics. So the, the Ferrari quartic, uh, fourth degree equation. They solve all cubics and all quartics. They have no interest in keeping this information to themselves. They want to reveal it to everyone. And yet they're not allowed to because in order to solve a quartic, you need to be able to solve a generic cubic. In order to solve a generic cubic, you need to, to solve a depressed cubic. And the solution to the depressed cubic belongs it, uh, by this oath to Tartaglia. Okay? Now, as mathematicians often do, they went on a trip, and they went on a trip to Bologna. And when they got there, they said, oh, here's our library. Would you like to have a look? And they say, yes, please. We'd, like, we'd love to look around. And here's some notes from some famous mathematicians that have worked in Bologna. Here's a guy named Del Ferro. You want to look through his notes? Sure, we'd love to look through his notes. They open up Del Ferro's notes. They start leafing through. And lo and behold, what has been sitting there for 30 years... The depressed cubic for anyone to walk in and see, and it predates Cardano, uh, uh, Tartaglia, by a decade, if not more. So anyone can walk into the Bologna Library if they know what they're looking at. It's very, you know, it, these things are written kind of cryptically. It's hard to understand what's going on. But anyone can just walk in there and read off the depressed cubic and, and write it up themselves. So what do you do? You're Cardano, you're in Bologna, you're sitting on the solution to all cubics and all quartics. You're happy to reveal this to everyone. 
publishes it, I guess. Take everyone's jobs. No, they're not. They're Fior was a particularly assholeish uh, individual in in this story. Um, so here is the Ars Magna, the Great Art, by Cardano, 1545. And for the first 10 chapters, he's solving the linear equation and the quadratic equation. And here he is describing what, what to do with a cubic equation. Scipio del Ferro uh, solved the cubic and told the solution to Antonio Fior, who challenged Niccolo Tartaglia to a duel and gave him the opportunity to rediscover the solution for himself. Tartaglia explained to me how to do it, and then with Ferrari we learned how to do the, the cubic and the quadratic. He writes all this entire story out. I don't know how your Latin is, mine's non-existent. But I'm told that's what's that's what you see right here in chapter, what is that, eleven of Ars Magna. And he gives the solution. And says, yes, I learned it from Tartaglia. Yes, I promised Tartaglia I wouldn't reveal it to anyone, but it wasn't his, it's not his property. So I'm not breaking a solemn oath to God. This is like, you know, serious, serious thing to, to do. Of course, is Tartaglia satisfied with this? No. So he starts, they, they exchange a bunch of letters uh, that are getting angrier and angrier. Ferrari is like a, a, a hothead uh, getting in the middle of all of this. Eventually, Tartaglia comes to uh, their town, to Cardano and Ferrari, and challenges them to a duel. But of course, it's no match because Ferrari knows how to solve quartics. He absolutely decimates uh, Tartaglia. He's still not satisfied. They almost get into a, a, an actual duel to the death. Uh, but luckily, Tartaglia escapes. And anyway, so so that's the. Um, it's a fun story that not a lot of people know about. But that's how the cubic equation got to be. That's how the cubic equation got to be. So it was because of these, you know. Is mathematics invented or discovered? I don't know. But there, there's a funny time and place where a lot of people were thinking about these things. They had these duels. We should settle it. What's that, Hannah? You, you want to just say it? I was just saying we should bring back duels and, and settle arguments that way again. I like it. I like it. Although, when you're actually in the middle of one, I don't know. Uh, well, you'll have an oral exam. Uh, Right? You have your oral qualifying exam, that'll be maybe the closest to a duel. You have to survive the onslaught of the professors. Um, yeah. So, what was all of the fuss about? How do you actually solve a cubic? So, and why? The, the whole point of that story is to argue to you that they knew about complex numbers before they knew about negative numbers. So let me prove to you, first of all, that they don't know about negative numbers. Why don't they have negatives. It's very simple to argue. First, Cardano, so if you if you actually go through what he's what he solves, and this is let me show you a page of the actual work that he's doing. This is what it looks like. Okay, so he's got like a cube. Of course, what is a cube? What does x cubed mean? It means a cube. An x by x by x cube. And he's gonna subdivide that cube into a bunch of things. And he's going to arrange these pieces and he's talking about, you know, what do you do when you have a cube and a number is equal to a quadratic? You see this cubi in numero equalum quadratus. Sorry, can I ask a quick question? Please. If they interpreted cubes geometrically, then how did they interpret what a quartic was? Ah, that's, that's a great question. That's a great question. Um, my understanding is that it was a biquadratic. So a quartic is... A square by a square being multiplied. So they had to leave geometry in order to, to they this was really the beginning of leaving geometry, but that's a great question. Um, so why don't they have negatives? Because first he solves x cubed plus a constant is equal to a square. A cube plus a number is a square. Then he solves x cubed is equal to a constant plus a square. And then he solves x cubed plus a square is equal to a constant. And then he saw, so he's doing every single possible variation, which we today would recognize as the same thing. And why is he doing it? Because of this plus sign. And because he's literally drawing cubes and saying, how do I add pieces of cubes together? And he's doing this geometrically. So there's no such thing as a negative number. Number is a positive quantity that's being measured. 
okay? So they do not have negative numbers. Let me explain to you why they did have i, or why they were forced to reckon with i, it naturally, in the process of, of their investigations. So let's solve the, um, let's solve the cubic equation. OK. So how do you solve a cubic? You guys know how to solve a cubic? Has anyone seen the solution to a cubic? OK, so let's do it. Um, cubic equation, ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d equals 0. Now, if a is equal to 0, then it's not really a cubic. So let's say a is not equal to 0, then we can divide out by a. Equivalently, we can replace a by, by 1. So that's making the polynomial monic. Make it monic. OK, so now the a is gone. The next step is to depress it. How do you depress a cubic equation? In other words, we want another equation that has no x squared term. Yeah, uh, I, I, and you can easily see what lambda will need to be because, so if I, if I put in, um, oh, sorry, uh, replace x by x minus, so let's, let's do that. So that x is equal to y minus b over 3. That's what I want. And if I make the substitution x is equal to b, y minus b over 3, then x cubed becomes y minus b over 3 cubed, and b, x squared, is y minus b over 3 squared, and x is y minus b over 3, and that. Does everybody see that? I just made a change of variables. x is y minus b over 3. And let's look at what happens when we multiply all of this out. So this is the thing that was so hard. This is the, like, how could this possibly be so hard? Of course, it's because negatives are so hard for them to figure out. But they did figure this out, Ferrari and uh, Cardano, not Tartaglia. Right, um, some of them knew not depressed cubics, but cubics with no linear term instead of ter uh, cubics with no quadratic. Sorry, Arash, are you saying something? You're, you're muted. Are you trying to say something? No? Yeah? No. OK, sorry. Uh, right, so, so if we multiply this out, we get a y cubed. And then you know how to multiply out cubes, right? Yeah. So minus 3 times b over 3y squared plus things of lower order. OK, so that's this term is things of lower order. And how about the next term? So here I get a by squared plus things of lower order and then more things of lower order. And the only thing to observe is that the purpose of putting up 3b over 3 is with a minus sign is to kill off the by squared. So there's no y squared term. Okay, so that's how you depress a cubic. If you can solve this equation, so now you're going to get something like y cubed uh, plus a y plus b equals 0. If you can solve that equation, then you can solve the original by a simple substitution. And it's a god-awful mess. By the way, what happens to the quadratic equation? How do you solve a quadratic equation? You ever think about this? There was a New York Times article last year about solving a quadratic equation. Apparently, people really do not understand the general population has a very hard time with quadratic equations. It's exactly the same thing when you solve a quadratic equation. First, you make it monic. So you make it monic by dividing by a. Let's really do it now. Then you depress it. Depress means get rid of the next order term. So if I set x equal to y minus b over 2a, that will have the effect of depressing it, right? So because if I, let's see, y minus b over 2a squared 
plus b times x is y minus b over 2a plus c equals 0. If we work out what this is, so I get a y squared um, minus 2b over 2ay plus b squared over 4a squared. That's this first bit. Plus b y squared minus, I guess, b squared over 2a plus c. Y, y is not squared in that term. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And then 50 plus yeah. uh, What am I doing? There's an over A missing where? Uh, in the last two lines, the B over A, right? Ah, thank you, thank you, thank you. B over A and C over A, and that's a B over A, and that's a C over A. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We would have been in trouble in this in a second. Okay? So, Professor? Yes. Uh, so by depressing, you mean shifting of roots of the polynomial, right? By depressing, you mean what, what effect does it have uh, like on the roots? Shift, like we are shifting the roots of the polynomial by b by 2a, right? It because makes the, the of, yes, it makes the sum of the roots zero. Yes, yes. The next, the next order term is the sum of the roots. So we're just shifting so that the sum of the roots is zero. So in the case of a quadratic, what you're doing is wherever it was, you're sliding it so that it's symmetric about the y-axis. That's what this shift accomplishes. Okay, which you know from calculus that you need to shift by b over 2a because the derivative of this thing has a root at b, negative b over 2a. So that's where the peak is. That's where the extreme is. Okay, and then when you put everything together, of course the whole point was that this y term and that y term are gone, and what's left over, there's, um, so wait a second, now I have an a squared, that's good. That would have been a big problem. So now I have negative a half plus a quarter b squared over a squared. Well, let's continue up here. Let's see. Can you see that is as high as I can go? Okay. So I have a y squared. I have a, uh, what is this? Minus a quarter b squared over a squared plus c over a which I can make an AC over A squared, just to put it over a common denominator. In fact, let's make it a 4AC over 4A squared equals 0. And now everybody knows what to do. Now it's trivial. Once we've depressed, you depress a quadratic, you're done. Right? Y squared is equal to, let me bring everything to the other side, over 4A squared, and then I have a B squared uh, minus 4ac. And then you take square roots. And that's the quadratic equation. So what happens with the cubic equation, once you depress it, you're still screwed. You're not done. It's just as hard as the original cubic. You have a cubic, and how, how in the world are you supposed to solve this thing? This is what people were stuck on. This is the difference between what, what people knew in Babylonian times and in India and in China and so on, and the, the, um, the miraculous idea that occurred to Delferra, that he gave Tartaglia the opportunity to discover, which then Cardano took much farther with Ferrari. So what do you do? You have a coffee, you, you go for a walk, what do you do? Uh, I, I think the way you're supposed to do it is you can write a Y as something like W plus C. Perfect. And you can and then you can set W to something to make your, your life easier. Okay, so let's look. So here's the, the uh, stroke of genius, I would say. So here's the key idea. Is a completely auxiliary calculation having nothing to do with what's going on. Let's look at uh, you want to use W and Z? Let's use, uh, fine, W and Z. Let's look at W plus Z cubed. And that's exactly, by the way, what he's doing here. 
He's working out something like W plus E cubed. This is chapter 12. He's working out what happens when you take W plus Z and you cube it. Right? He chops it up into all these pieces and assembles these pieces. Thankfully, today we have algebra, which was nowhere near developed. I mean, you can sort of, if you read this, I'll, I'll, I'll put this in Sakai so you can uh, really, you know, struggle with it yourself and, and, and have a look at what he's doing, how he's chopping up the pieces and what he's adding up. And this is his attempt to, to draw the picture. Um, thankfully, today we just go, okay, it's W cubed plus 3W squared Z. Whoops, Z plus 3WZ squared plus Z cubed. We didn't do anything, right? This is a useless calculation. Well, it's algebra, so we should put everything on one side. And let's make a simple observation, kind of a, a funny observation, that this is 3WZ times W plus Z. Okay, let's move everything to one side. W plus Z cubed minus 3WZ times W plus Z um, minus Z cubed minus W cubed is equal to zero. And that is just a, a fact of life. That's a universal, it has nothing to do with cubics. Just a universal calculation for any uh, commutative algebra. This this is a this is a fact, right? But now what? Other than Ozan, it was depressed in W plus Z. So if we choose Z and W nicely, yes. We pattern match to this. We pattern match this and this. And we notice that this looks like y cubed. And this looks like y. So if only we could make this equal to a and this equal to b, we would solve the depressed cubic. So now we have two solutions. We need to solve, so A and B are coefficients, are constants. We need to solve, need to solve. Um, A is equal to negative three WZ. Of course, he would never write it like this because there's a negative sign. B is equal to negative Z cubed minus W cubed. So if we can solve, we went from a single cubic equation to a pair of the highest order is cubic equations in two unknowns. It takes uh, it takes some you know. I don't want to say, cojones. It takes some courage. It takes some courage to continue with this calculation. This looks like we're we're going in the wrong direction, right? Well, it's pretty easy to solve actually. You guys want to take, should I give you a minute to, uh, to work on the solution yourselves? You got a pair of things here. Take a minute, work on it yourselves. I'll work on it slowly on the side and we'll see if we get the same answer. I mean, what's the first step? Okay, everybody's, everybody's hard at work. I'm gonna shut up. Give me a thumbs up if you're done already. 
just waiting for me to catch up. Good, everybody's still working. Let me pause for a second here. Did anyone, so did everyone solve for some version of one of the variables in the first equation, which is pretty easy to isolate? So I, I chose w to isolate w as a over negative three z. And then I, if you just negate everything, you get z cubed plus w cubed is negative b. So I did z cubed plus w cubed is negative b. And then I just multiplied through by z cubed and moved everything to one side. So I get a z to the 6 plus bz cubed minus a cubed over 27 equals 0. Now this looks really bad. We were trying to solve a cubic, and we got ourselves a sextic, degree 6 equation. We're going the wrong direction. But the miracle of miracles, this has to do with uh, you guys taking algebra, the group S3 is solvable. So this is what Gawa figured out, but we, that's, I'm not supposed to be teaching you, I'm not supposed to be teaching you any of this, um, but I think it's important to know. Uh, right, this is a quadratic in Z cubed, of course. That's the miracle, and it's the miracle of the solvability of the symmetric group on three elements. Um, and this, a similar miracle happens for the quartic and, and not for the quintic. So when you do this for the quintic, you depress it, you, you, you make it monic, you depress it, you're staring at some really complicated thing. For 300 years, people were like, how come I can't figure out some really, really clever thing like this really, really clever pattern matching thing? They, they, in the span of 30 years, they went from not knowing how to solve anything beyond a quadratic to solving cubics and quartics using this trick. And for the next 300 years, they're sitting there going, come on, somebody's got to be smart enough to figure this out. How do you solve a quintic in radicals? Okay, so Ruffini, Abel, and eventually Gawa gave the uh, group theoretic explanation of what's going on. All right, so we have a quadratic in Z cubed. So let's finish this off. Quadratic in Z cubed, uh, what's the solution? Uh, z cubed is, since we know the quadratic formula, negative b plus or minus, let's just take one root. If we have one root, we can pull that out and we're left with a quadratic from our original cubic. Square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Did you guys get this for z? Now remember, let's see. Can I do that? That actually works. Uh, remember, let me rewrite it here. That z cubed plus w cubed is equal to negative b. I mean, that's where this equation came from. Right? Okay. So, um, so what? So we can solve for w cubed as well. W cubed is. Uh, if I move this to the other side, so it's negative b minus this, negative b minus this. Is everybody checking my arithmetic? It's very easy to make a mistake here, and then we'll be screwed if, if this doesn't come out right for what I want to say. So hopefully you guys are getting the same calculation. Who's totally with me and following along and has the same thing as I do in their computation? Okay, awesome. Is anyone stuck on anything? Is anyone lost on any bit of the algebra? Please, I started, Ishan. I started with the other variable. I'm re solving it again. Okay. Go, well, you should still get the same. Okay, so what'd you get for the other variable? Let's see if we match. I didn't finish when you started talking. And I, I'm gotcha. Now solving the other one. All right, yeah. let me give you a minute. Take Take four minutes. I don't want to rush you. This is an important calculation. Thank you. 
Mr. Metric and W plus Z. I mean, I guess started with W as well. Uh, but and what'd you get for W? Just, you just swap the names and then right the here. There's a symmetry, yes. But this this one is uh, minus P minus the square root of the two, right? That's what I'm getting as well. Which we can make slightly, well, so, so what is Z? It's the cube root of this. Cube root of this whole god awful thing. We can simplify it ever so slightly by making it negative B over two plus square root of B squared over four plus A cubed over 27. This is a three. If I'm ever writing too small, can you guys see the screen, by the way? Hopefully you would have stopped me. Uh-oh. Come on. Okay. Still good? Um, okay, so everybody has this? Or you still need more time? Nick is still calculating. Take your time. I'm writing it down. You're just writing it down. That's that's important too. So W is the cube root of negative B over two minus square root of B squared over four plus A cubed over 27. This by the way is called the discriminant of the cubic, B squared over four plus A cubed over 27. All right, and that gives us our final equation because what was Y y was w plus z. Right? That's how we pattern matched. We would we would get y is equal to w plus z. And so the reason nobody teaches the cubic formula in high school, all this algebra is like eighth grade algebra, right? There's no reason they don't teach it. Because you can't memorize it in a nice formula. y is equal to this god awful thing. I don't even want to write it down again. Cube root of that thing plus cube root of that thing. And you would never want to memorize this. You would want to take the equation you're given. Now, this is in terms of big B and big A, which we got in terms of little a and little b by some really god-awful formula. I and mean, if you want to destroy your, uh, I don't know, weak, go and write out what this formula really is in terms of all of the initial coefficients. I mean, it's, there's no reason for it. It's absolute jargon. Nick, you want to say something? No. So, um, great. So, they, so this is how they did it. This is a modern reinterpretation of, of how they did it. Um, and then, so let's try an example. Let's try this on an example. Example. X cubed Minus 15x minus 4. Okay, let's solve this by the cubic formula. So this, negative 15, is A. Negative 4 is B. And what's the discriminant? B squared over 4 plus A cubed over... Let's, let's make this uh, A over 3 cubed. So b squared, b squared is 16, over 4 is 4. a over 3, a is negative 15. I don't want to cube negative 15, but I have no problem cubing negative 5. Is that what everybody got? What's the problem? Nick, you're muted. Sorry? Plus minus 11i. Yeah, we have to take the square root of negative 121. 
And we don't even like negative numbers. And we're going to take the square root of negative numbers. Right? So they said, all right. It's really funny to read these old manuscripts and see how people started dealing with this. So, um, well, let, let's write down what the solution is supposed to be. Let's see. Is there any way for me to show you this in this at the same time? I think I can do this. Let's do this. So z would be... That's a little high. There we go. There we go. Z would be the cube root of negative b over 2. b was uh, negative 4. So negative b over 2 is 2 plus what we would today write as 11i. And then uh, if you remember that w is the same thing except with a minus. This is plus minus 11i cube root. Sorry, so this is now this is now y, or x, whatever, whatever our variable was. I'm just plugging it into the, the cubic formula. This is what they're they're faced with. And after a whole bunch of poking around, what they realize, so here's the, the game that they realize. If you take two plus i and cube it. What happens if you take 2 plus i and cube it? So 2 cubed is 8, plus 3 times 2 squared times i, um, minus 3 times 2. The minus is from i squared. And then minus i is i cubed. And is that good? Kayla? Could that be plus i? Um, i cubed. Plus i cubed. Oh, oh, sorry. I thought there was cubed there, but there isn't. <laughs> yep. I cheated. Well, I rushed ahead a little. So what do we get? 8 minus 6? And 12 minus 1? So 2 plus 11i, if there's anything that should be the cube root of 2 plus 11i, it should be 2 plus i. And by the same, by a very similar argument, 2 minus i will be the cube root of 2 minus 11i. And when you add these two things together, And look back at the original equation. x cubed minus 15x minus 4. x cubed, 4 cubed, uh, 1664. Uh, minus 4 times 15 is 60. Minus 4 is 0. Duh. So that's why they were willing to entertain the notion of imaginary numbers and complex numbers. They were willing to entertain this notion to get at a real solution. Whatever the cubic is doing, it crosses through 4, and that's a real solution. And all right, there's this uh, black magic mambo jumbo with complex numbers, but don't worry about it, just swallow it. In the end, when you know all these tricks, you'll find the real solution. How did they find, um, how did they not discover negative numbers in the process? How did they discover negative numbers in the process? How did they avoid discovering negative numbers in the process? Well, it's not that they avoided discovering negatives. It's that they allowed square roots of negatives to be things that they are willing to manipulate, unlike negatives, which they were unwilling to manipulate for much, much longer. Oh, so they knew about negatives? Well, certainly they knew about subtraction, but because they were doing everything physically, geometrically, with drawing cubes, they were stuck at not uh, allowing the, for negative 2 as a, as a concept in itself to exist. Whereas 11i, fine, I'll let you have 11i because I need it in order to get 4, a real number. So this kind of began a revolution in allowing things that aren't real to interfere with uh, reality. All right, any questions on the cubic? 
solving the cubic and why. This is where complex numbers came from. I wanted you to know where, why we're dealing with complex numbers. Nick, you were going to say something? I was thinking about it. I'm not going to. Okay, <laughs> you'll tell me later. Okay, well, I was going to ask, will this be on the exam? <laughs> there are no exams. There's a, there's a final. Um, this is for your own general knowledge. Somebody else had a question. I heard a, a voice. I have two questions, but they may okay. take us out of course. Go ahead and ask them, and if they're too far afield, then. Sure, awesome. Um, one, why did people start caring about uh, polynomials to begin with? That's a great question. Um, already the Greeks cared about polynomials because they wanted to have a cube that had twice the volume of another cube. I want to double the cube. That's one of the ancient uh, problems from you know, geometry. How do you double a cube? In other words, how, is cube root of three a constructible number? Which eventually in the 1800s we realized is not. What was your, did that answer your question? And what's your second question? Uh, I realized the answer to my second question. Okay. All right. So, um, gosh, I did not mean for that to burn uh, almost all of our time. Um, what can I do very quickly? Fine. So there are complex numbers. Like, you have to be really clever to find this kind of thing. How did you know to look for 2 plus i? It's not until Euler that people start really thinking about... Even Euler, it's not clear historically. I always attributed Euler to the, to the person that thought of complex numbers as living on a plane instead of just some abstraction. But, uh, I don't know. I'm not a historian. I'm told people like Vassal and... Aragand, how do you say his name? Argand. Argand. This is like late 1700s, early 1800s. And uh, of course, Gauss. Uh, and by the time we get to, I mean, the, the main character that, that we will be, whose work we will be uncovering is uh, Kashi. Kashi was the one that was really starting to study uh, complex numbers on a plane. This was, a, this was already 300 years after people are dealing with complex numbers to solve algebraic things, the complex numbers get a geometry to them. Okay, so now we have the geometry of complex numbers and Cauchy starts investigating what it means to differentiate uh, complex valued functions, to study complex valued functions. This is already, we're so used to graphing and what, what's a complex valued function from the complexes to, I mean, this is R2 to R2. So to see a graph of it, we would need four dimensions. We don't have four dimensions. So people do all kinds of uh, other things to pretend that we can see complex valued functions. Um, but what we're going to study in a nutshell is what do derivatives look like? What do integrals? How do we integrate complex analytic functions? And um, the thing that's, um, you, you, you had just spent an hour uh, talking about real analysis. And real analysis, like, I think of real analysis as the, uh, I can't really call it hell. Uh, it's like everything that you would want to be true, none of it is true. It is like technicality upon technicality. There's a million definitions. Like it took hundreds of years for very clever people to figure out the right quote unquote way to do real analysis. And still there's plenty of argument about, uh, about that. Complex analysis, there's one definition. What is a complex derivative? And it's the definition you already know. I don't have to tell you the definition because you already know it. It's the same definition as the real definition. It just has so much more meaning packed into it. Um, once a function is once differentiable and it's complex analytic, it's complex differentiable, then it's infinitely differentiable. Every integral is zero. It's like um, you want to interchange limits and, and uh, integrals, go ahead. Limits and series, go ahead. It's, it's an absolutely gorgeous subject where I think of complex analysis as heaven. It's like, it's better than what you should expect to be remotely possible to, to be true. So real analysis, you do all this very hard work in order to show some fraction of what should be true is true. And complex analysis, you do very little work and it just completely naturally flows. So we're gonna study, uh, the, the, the two for me highlights are the Riemann mapping theorem. We'll study uh, conformal, uh, conformal functions and uh, the prime number theorem, which, uh, so I learned this subject from, from Eli Stein uh, when he was writing this book. And his whole uh, thesis was 
look at how amazing complex analysis is, it even can solve things about you know, prime numbers. These discrete, what, what do discrete prime numbers have to do with complex analysis? I, I took away the opposite lesson from, from the one he meant to impart. Look at how awesome number theory is that you can use tools as far away as complex analytic functions to say something about prime numbers. Anyway, so we're out of time. Uh, we will get to actual complex analysis 